Monarch Legacy of Monsters. That's right, folks. It's here. The new live-action Godzilla and King Kong show that takes place in the MonsterVerse. Isn't it weird to think that this is one of the most successful cinematic universes, that it actually gets a prequel-adjacent spin-off that makes sense towards the continuity? That's really weird to think about. This is, of course, the big property from Apple TV now. It's one of their first, like, existing IPs that they're delving into. They've made a lot of original content. They've made a lot of their own stuff based on books, too, but this is part of an existing thing. Now, a couple of years ago, I think it was at this point, Legendary separated from Warner Brothers due to some bullshit and their stupid stuff. So, did they pick up this show from Warner Brothers and Apple's like, yeah, we'll release this, we'll be the home for Godzilla stuff? I don't know, because there's also like some animated shows that are in conjunction with the Monsters Verse that's on Netflix, so I don't know what the real timeline is for that. I haven't seen those. I do know Apple getting this property is probably a big deal. And it shows that they're both going to be the home for auteurs and for IPs that need a place to flourish, because this definitely feels like it could flourish more being on Apple than it would being another thing on Max or another thing on Netflix. It feels really cool that it's over here. I really like the show. Two episodes have come out at this point. If the numbers are good for these reviews, we're going to keep talking about it weekly just because I think the show has a lot of interesting stuff in it. And it's kind of fun just to like explore this world again, get back into it. I've always been a Godzilla fan. When this video comes out, the following video that will be dropping is going to be based on Godzilla again. So, like, I'm back in this world in a big way. I'm just very excited to see what's coming up and what we're going to be doing. And the MonsterVerse, it's pretty fine. Like, I don't hate any of the movies. And this one does a lot of time jumping where we're, like, starting here, we're going there. I think, like, within the two episodes, we're in, like four different time periods which isn't too bad like that's pretty easy to manage especially since it was like about two timelines an episode so the first episode we open up on skull island and we're following john goodman he is bill randa and he has a little brief cameo i think he's going to appear again in the show but it's just kind of like open up like the narrative flow of this and he is being chased by a big spider. He gets to the edge of a cliff where we think he's going to die. And he's like recording his final message. He puts it into a bag and he throws it into the ocean. Hopefully somebody will find it, but it probably means he's dead. This Was this before Skull Island? I can't remember like the specific timeline of Skull Island was this moment. Like, I, I think it is before because then he's found in Skull Island by them, isn't he? I can't remember that, but Big Crab emerges from a rock and saves him. And then his, his stuff just, just lost its sea to be discovered 40 years later in 2013, a year before G-Day happens. So that's how this opens. Very strong opening. Right away, I'm like, you got John Goodman. I'm all in. I'm very excited to see what's going to happen next. So then we get two timelines in this episode. We follow the one in 2015. This is not set in the present day. It's set in 2015. And we are following the aftermath of G-Day. We're following this woman named Kate who was coming to Tokyo and she was a survivor of the events of San Francisco where she actually witnessed what happened when Godzilla attacked there. We get some really cool flashbacks to her experiencing that. We'll talk about them in a minute, but she is our lead on Asewa, Anasewa, that's her name, the actress. She's really fun. She's coming to find her father's apartment. So her father died sometime that we'll get to in a minute here too, and she has keys to his apartment that she knows is in Tokyo and when she steps inside there's another family there so she is finding out in real time that her father had another family in Tokyo while her and her mother lived in San Francisco and this is where she meets Kentaro who's her half-brother and then the other wife of her father Amiko now having just watched the original Godzilla 1954 we know Amiko is the name of a character that's in that movie and then I was thinking like Ken Watanabe and the 2014 movie was Sirizawa, and I was like, is her father Sirizawa? And I'm like, no, it's not. It's a different guy together. But I had that brief second where I'm like, is that what we're doing? No, it's not. So we have two children of this mysterious scientist that we later learn works for Monarch in some capacity, and he's a secretive guy who disappeared a long time ago. 
And now both children and both mothers are looking for answers that they don't really know how to get. This leads them to just ripping apart his office trying to figure it out. There is a realistic tension here. Like, like I feel like if you're going to meet like the secret family of your father, you, you'd play it one of two ways. You're like, this is fucked up and you'd freak out. Or you're just like, I don't want to associate with this. And we get the like latter half of that where it's like, I really don't want to be here. I'm going to go. But as Kate leaves this apartment, just to, like get on of her life, there is a alert for Godzilla and it sends her into a flashback. And I love that. This feels so cool. I love that Tokyo has this whole different vibe than the other cities. It's like, there was an attack from a big monster, right? We're going to prepare. So when we're like driving down the streets of Tokyo, we're seeing like they have big missiles everywhere. They have like safe houses everywhere, places you can go to be protected. I think that is so cool and so fun. I also kind of like the small hint of the idea that maybe parts of the world don't actually believe something happened. It plays into the conspiracy thing of it all. Where there's a big shadowy organization blocking out everything. Her taxi driver's like, yeah, it's all CG. It's all fake. I have a podcast about it. That's funny. In 2015, you would have a podcast. That's kind of funny. I do dig that. But they go to a safe house. Kentaro helps Kate out there. And they're kind of just like watching a flashback of her happen. Because she was in San Francisco. She was like a school teacher. And she was on a school bus of a bunch of students. When Godzilla destroys a bridge. She just walks through it and destroys it. Godzilla looks her right in the eye. That's kind of scary. Destroys the bridge. And the, the bus is about to fall off the shattered remainder of the bridge. And you're like, oh shit. Is she going to get all the kids off safely? No, no. She watches a bunch of her students fall off the bridge in the bus and potentially drown and die. And I'm like, no shit. This woman is scarred for life. That is messed up. That's messed up. But the alert's kind of okay. Nothing really happened. So now she and Kentaro go break up their father's office and they find the secret files, which are from Bill Randa, which we realize is connected to... It took a minute for me to figure out the timeline because I'm like, oh, yeah, Bill Randa. He's, yeah, okay, he's the one from Skull Island because Bill Randa is also in the previous timeline from 57 where we follow Keiko and a young Bill played by that guy you've seen everywhere. I don't remember his name. And this is where we get Lee Shaw. This is where we see Wyatt Russell's Lee Shaw. Those two, not Lee, Lee works for the government, but Keiko and Bill are kind of like working and associated with Monarch. They are investig investigating some like seismic activity in some secret places, some radioactive land somewhere. And they head inside, they find this like abandoned building place. They're like, okay, there's some weird activity going on in this like entire complex. We should blow it up and figure everything out. We also see in this timeline that Keiko and Bill are dating or together in some capacity. And I'm just going to bury the lead here so we don't have to worry about it anymore. Keiko and Bill are the grandparents of Kentaro and Kate. So their father is the child that Keiko and Bill are going to have eventually. Kate and Kentaro are both Aranda. And you're like, okay, that's a lot. So there's the timeline. It does make sense. It makes sense that they're grandparents more so than they are parents. I appreciate that. So they find these secret files and they want to know how they can encrypt them. So they go to their hacker friend that lives in Tokyo. Who plays her? It's Kirstie Clemens, right? So she hacks into it and they find all like this Monarch data. And that sends an alert to Monarch. And you might be thinking like, there's not much Godzilla going on here. But I'm satisfied with it. You know, we have this stuff at the beginning on Skull Island. We have the flashback where Godzilla destroys a bridge. And we have the stuff happening in the past timeline in 57 where we witness our trio of that time period finding like these weird hidden eggs under like this abandoned complex so they head down the eggs hatch and they get into like a huge scrap and it's kind of intense and freaky what's happening there weird insectoid eggs clearly showing us that monarch's been investigating this for a long time and as they're trying to escape because it's lee and keiko down at the bottom Keiko gets killed by these creatures. You're like, what the hell? How did she have a baby then? I guess it's 57 and we do flashback in the next episode. So you're just like, man, they she had a baby in that time? Okay, I suppose. <laughs> but that's a really good opening episode. The effects look really good. The acting is pretty good. There's a couple of moments where I'm like, yeah, I can I can feel that this needed maybe another take or two, but I'm still impressed with it. 
What did surprise me, though, and I'll say this now just because I'm a comic book fan, Matt Fraction's the showrunner? <laughs> I'm like, what? Matt Fraction? You moved up, man. You made it to the big leagues. That's really cool. He's got a good sensibility for this stuff, so that's kind of impressive. That's a good, strong first episode. You know, we're building the tension right. Monarch is still like the shadowy organization. We have to figure out the truths about them. I appreciate all that. I dig it that way. I'm liking it. We're having fun. I just want to say now, before we get any further, Wyatt Russell, when he is clearly playing opposite his father, my God, do they have the same energy. Wyatt Russell does a good parody of his father. I love it so much. And when we see Kurt in this one, the dude's still got it. So Kurt shows up in the second episode. We'll get to that. But this one, we're seeing more of the fallout. Now things are starting to pick up in the second episode. We have a couple of agents of Monarch who were like scanning the stuff that our, you know, trio of modern day sleuths figured out. And now they're coming to attack them. So one of these men named Tim, he finds Kate while she's trying to get out of Tokyo, kidnaps her. But when she is like blindfolded with a bag over her head, she freaks out because she's having a panic attack because it's just like going dark on G day. So it manages to flip the car and she escapes. Love that. Really good use of that. I dig it. I, I kind of do like we're in Tokyo still. I know in like the American stuff it happened in San Fran and whatever, but the fact that we're in Tokyo and spending a lot of time in Tokyo, that does make me happy. That feels very nostalgic and cool. I appreciate that. Then Tim goes to try to get Kentaro and they have to like use a distraction with his mother so he can escape with the files and take everything with him. He also finds one of like the old video reels that we see in the past timeline that his grandfather was using. And that's when we are introduced to our trio in the 50s meeting for the first time. This is happening in 1952. So it's five years earlier from when Keiko is going to die. So sometime in those five years, she has a child. Or maybe she survives that attack. I don't know. But what happens is Wyatt Russell, Lee Shaw, he is working for the army. He gets into a couple of scrapes because he's kind of a dickhead because he doesn't like women being beat up. So he's a cool guy. So he is charged of like helping this random scientist lady deal with this thing. He does have a little bit of a beat where he's like, you're a scientist and you're a girl. And I'm like, yeah, I guess it's 52. I can't fault him for being a man in the military saying that. He quickly realizes that doesn't matter. So they start to bond as they're headed to this location in the Philippines. And basically they're looking for the seismic activity, something that's weird in the area, some weird flight patterns of birds. And that's when they just randomly stumble into bill who just shows up one day and he's like hey i think we're looking at the same thing and why it's like this is not normal some random dude just showed up i'm not going to be responsible for this bullshit so he leaves the two of them and keiko and bill start to form a bond like yeah we're doing something cool we're having a good time we're having a good energy they stumble across an old marine an old naval ship is it the Langston or langston or something like that Leston or something like that and it's a ship that bill served on and he's like i knew we hit something that wasn't just debris something hit us and took us here like he's the only survivor and that's when they find this mysterious ship there and you're like that's kind of an interesting story like nobody would have found that ship earlier though it's just in the middle of the fucking woods like it's exposed you'd find it i'm pretty sure somebody would find it i don't know I guess if you're not looking, it is 52. What are you doing in the woods, right? I don't know. <laughs> but that is when uh, they find a bunch of like slime and shit building up in that place. And they are attacked by another kaiju. Who is it this time? I don't know. But because we do updated versions for a lot of our monsters, I think it's B Bagora. Bagora is like a bat one that we've seen in the comics from godzilla so i'm like maybe they're introducing that it does have like some bat like wings and it does fly kind of in the way like a bat has two legs and the pointed ears so i'm thinking it might be bagora i don't know if we've seen that character before in the rest of the monster verse or if this is not that character until i'm proven otherwise that's what i'm gonna operate under the assumption of lee comes back and he saves them from being killed by a giant bat thing and he's like yep there's dragons here. This is messed up. I'm part of something bigger than I ever imagined. I hate all of this. 
And that is when the trio of the 50s is formed. Now they all see the same shit. Lee is going to help them on their mission to figure out what's going on with all these monsters because they're working for Monarch. And that's pretty fun. I do like it. And the effects look really good for back in the day. I, I'm really digging the vibe. Like, it's so well paced, too. Where I'm like, yeah, this is written and feels like it's a TV show, which is kind of rare, surprisingly, when it comes to television with IP. Sometimes it's not written well or paced well, but this one is paced surprisingly well. So we have a bunch of material in the present timeline of 2015 where we know that Bill was working against some stuff at Monarch, getting some different secrets. He might still be on Skull Island or trapped. I don't know what happened to John Goodman. And now these kids are being attacked by Monarch. They have to go somewhere secretive and figure out, like, who, who's an ally they could find that could help them out of this situation? Well, the only person that they can think of is a friend of the family, Lee Shaw. And that is when our trio of young kids... So we have Kirsty Clemen character. I think her name is May or Mai, something like that. So May and Kate and Kentaro head to this weird sanctuary somewhere on the outskirts of Tokyo. And that is when we learn that maybe he's like a mental patient here like he had something go on where he's trapped here but it's kurt russell kurt russell shows up big actor kurt russell and he's played an old old man because i don't know how old wyatt is supposed to be in that timeline i'm guessing he's like 20 because then 50, 60 years later or like 40 something years later in 2015 he'd be like 70 to 80 it's not perfectly added up, but I buy it well enough. So Kurt shows up, right? And he's like, hey, you look familiar. And they're like, yeah, you might know my dad. Ashiro, is that his name? Yoshihara, something like that? I can't remember the name of their father, but, you know, we're both Randas. And he's like, ah, I know exactly why you're here. Maybe we should talk somewhere. There's no cameras and nobody can hear us. So they start walking outside of the sanctuary and he's like, all right. I don't know what you're doing or what you're expecting, but I don't know what you need me to help you with. And that's when Kate's like, well, our dad mysteriously vanished in a helicopter accident like days after the events of G-Day. And I'd like to know what the hell happened to him. And Kurt's like, okay, I am happy to help you on this case. I mean, I'm like 105. I'm really bored. I can easily take off this ankle monitor because this is actually a prison and we'll have 60 seconds to decide if you want me to help you or not. So what's it going to be, boys? Yes or no? What's it going to be, boy? Yes or no? And that's when we're just going to see Lee Shaw in the present timeline is going to take these kids on an adventure to figure out what's happening to them and what they're entangled in. And I'm pretty cool with that. A big element of Godzilla should be like the governments or like the people reacting to the world. So when we have a show that's dealing with like the cryptic conspiracy side of all of that, I'm on board. I think that's a really fun thing to explore. And it makes me really happy. And I am very excited to see what's coming next from this show. This was a strong first couple of episodes. It got the tone right. It got the pace right. I, I know I probably like this more than like a casual person where I'm like, oh my God, we're doing some big stuff. Godzilla's killing people, man. Whoa, it's crazy. Casualties left and right. And I'm like, yeah, that's sick. I think that's awesome. So this works for me on a bunch of levels. I really dig it. And I'm very curious to see where we're headed. Like, what is the end game here? Are we going to see, like, older versions of, like, Kentaro and Kate and May in the new Empire movie? Like, are we going to see them there? Are we connecting the tissue that much? Maybe. I wouldn't be opposed to that. But just for, like, supplemental material in between the movies where it's like, let's connect all these characters and give you, like, two Russells playing the same Shaw. It's pretty impressive. They managed to pull it off so far. I'm very curious to see where it's going to go, how much more we're going to get. I'm guessing a lot. It's pretty cool. So I'm curious. And if this does well, we'll be back to talk more Monarch Legacy of Monsters. But until then, thank you all for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. As always, you can check me out on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck.